Mark Van Dyne speaking. Hi, it's Elizabeth Powell from Space.com. How's it going? Good. How are yourself? Oh, very good, thank you. So uh, I guess to begin, you know, given your experience working overseas, um, working in the military, being in sort of isolated environments there, how do you find that NEMO compares to that? I've never been uh, nine days in a com uh, container this small, but that's not really the significant thing. The significant, the significant thing for me is how amazing this environment is. It's, I mean, when I dove in the past to 60 feet, just something where you have to pay attention to the minutes because you've got about 60 minutes or so, and then you're heading right up to the surface. That time flies by. Well, you know, living down here for nine days, it's it's really, really amazing. And just, it's been all day just staring out the window at the amazing different fish going by. It's neat. <laughs> I'm sure it's hard not to be distracted. So uh, your days are tightly scheduled. Is this something that um, is helping you prepare, of course, for a space flight? Yes. Um, I haven't been in space yet, but my understanding, I've, I've uh, worked in the mission control team and watched as the crew members in space have tried to keep up with the timelines there, and I've always kind of wondered what it would be like being on the other side, and this definitely gave me a, a good sense of it. There's The good days are the days when you're always keeping just a little bit ahead of the timeline. The bad days are the ones when you uh, can't find what you need and, you know, something causes you to to have to abort a task or have it postponed or maybe the ground control team has to reschedule a different day just to, to get something back in the plan because you couldn't pull it off on the day you were supposed to initially. And uh, how do you manage both the science and the maintenance tasks that you need on the station? Um, I think you asked me how I do the maintenance tasks. Well, how do you manage having, scheduling both maintenance and science in the Aquarius lab? So uh, it's all scheduled. Uh, the priorities are decided by the, the program office, and um, just like just like the space station has a software schedule that shows you what you're supposed to be doing and the procedures attached to, to each of those events, we have something similar but under development uh, that we're using down here. Oh, interesting. You said there's a software under development for Nemo that would be similar to what's used on the station? Same, same ideas. They're trying to make something that's uh, readily available on a, a wider variety of platforms so that we're not tied to a laptop to see what the plan is. As we're getting more technologies, uh, smaller you know, mobile devices, those, it would be nicer for us to be able to use things like those in space to look at our plans. Right, because people. you're also able to use um, iPads and iPhones and other devices on in the, uh, the lab, correct? That's correct. Very nice. So uh, I can see that your team has been working on a number of spacewalks, uh, starting to implement that time delay. So how does that change the planning for a spacewalk when you have a five or ten minute delay introduced between communications? So it doesn't change the, the planning so much. It changes the execution significantly. Um, we've always done spacewalks with the space shuttle and space station where we've had uh, people come in to the ground control team that are well versed in what's supposed to happen on the spacewalk. Um, and then there's the person in space who we call the in-vehicle person. who's kind of actually running the spacewalk. They, they are not in a spacesuit. They're in a spacecraft. They've got all the procedures written out in front of them, so they can afford to read those procedures to the crew member. Then the crew members are, uh, of course, outside. They've got tools in their hands. They're in a spacesuit. They, they can't take notes. So they just follow the step-by-step -step instructions given to the other person in space. Well, for us, we did the same thing. The only difference was... Um, the ground is not able to uh, react in real time to give the IV some ad advice about uh, uh, how to troubleshoot something. For us, the time delays uh, were really about going someplace like Mars and trying to figure out how would we have a non-geologist, um, somebody who's only had a couple weeks of geology training, maybe not a professional geologist, go to Mars where there's a lot of geologists really, really invested in getting the best possible samples from Mars to help us understand the solar system better and have this, uh, but have somebody who doesn't have that much education on geology be their hands. And with a 10 minute delay like we experienced today in each direction, um, you can't lift up a rock, hold it to a camera and say, is this the one you want? So what we did is we had a circuit of four different places. We went to the first place, we showed a variety of things and a survey of the general area, and then after we felt like we gave that information to the person in the, in the spacecraft, so the person with no time delay, who then texted that information to the ground. And then uh, after that 
IV acted like a quality control person. Uh, they sent, we sent uh, today. I was an IV, and a couple other of my uh, teammates were outside. So once I got that information, I gave it to the ground, and I told the uh, the, the people outside the spacecraft to head to the next spot. Well, after they spent enough time going around the circuit, um, I had already gotten back the information from the ground that hey, here's the priorities for the first site. So. I sent them back to the first site, but now armed with uh, pictures and uh, details about things they wanted them to get. They also tested our ability to communicate, hey, they didn't pick this rock up, but over there, and you can see in this picture we're sending you back, we circled the rock that we really want them to get. So we have to try to direct them to something that they hadn't previously labeled or identified as well. That sounds quite uh, involved. Thank you. And can you walk me quickly through a typical day um, in the lab? So a uh, typical day for us down here has been uh, waking up at 6, uh, we've got some time to get up, shower, go to the bathroom about 7.20 or so, we'd have to put on some badges. We've got, in fact, right now I'm wearing a couple badges that uh, measure my proximity to other people in the crew, the my heart rate, my activity level, light exposure, um, that along with the surveys throughout the day after certain activities and even some uh, teamwork activities and hormo uh, saliva samples to test our home hormones to try to get a feel for um, what type of stressors, what type of uh, uh, interpersonal relations um, situations we're finding ourselves in here. Um, but honestly, I had a, this is a great group of people to be with. But after that, after putting on the badges, those type of things, then typically we'd have a spacewalk happen in the morning. Sometimes we did have one group in the morning and a different group in the afternoon. Um, we'd have some internal experiments. Uh, we had some experiments uh, testing our uh, how our um, how our inner ears mesh with our uh, brains to help us uh, help our eyes determine which uh, both eyes work together to uh, make a, a, a set picture. Um, even did some testing of equipment that might help improve tests on the space station. It's a lot easier to test the equipment here, see if it works well, and and convince people that this would be a good investment than it is to, to uh, send something up to the space station first. And then uh, that would take the whole day till about 6 o'clock or so, and then we'd have another meal together in the evening and uh, do more surveys. Typically around 8 p.m., we get what's called uh, pre-sleep, and 10 p.m. would be sleep. Um, but honestly, we'd be taking care of little details like looking at photos, trying to figure out which uh, were the best photos to send to the ground and things like that that would use up all our extra time. Okay. And just quickly, you mentioned that you are testing out tools um, during this mission that could be used in the International Space Station. Can you give me an example? Yeah, like there's a heart rate monitor up there that uh, crew members use when they work out, but there's been interference issues. There's so much uh, other electronics up there. Um, and it's just an old-fashioned watch and a heart rate monitor. Well, it turns out that it's much more, what, what I suspect they're going to realize, and maybe the demonstrators knew that was probably going to be the result. Um, there is Bluetooth technology that works really well and is not uh, bothered by the interference that uh, the older technology is experiencing. So using Bluetooth technology as a substitute to pick up data might, might help improve things. Okay, thank you. And is there anything else? No, oh, unless you have any other questions. No, that's great. Thank you very much for your time, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Space.com.